Hi, I'm Bishop Virgil the Doubtful, and this is the Book of Mormon, the poorly animated edition. First Nephi, Chapter 1. Okay, so let's get started. I, Nephi, having been born of goodly parents, ah, a little shout out to mom and dad there, therefore I was taught somewhat in all the learning of my father, and having seen many afflictions in the course of my days, nevertheless, having been highly favored of the Lord in all my days, yea, having had great knowledge of, see, this is really <laughs> just tiresome to read. There are so many sub-clauses in this. Uh, yea, yea, having had a great knowledge of the goodness and the mysteries of God, therefore I make a record and of the proceedings in my days. So many days. Yea, I make a record in the language of my father, which consists of the learning of the Jews and the language of the Egyptians. Why, why would it also be the language of the Egyptians? So, a little spoiler alert. Uh, this is supposed to be taking place in 600 BC, and the literal biblical view of the Exodus from Egypt is that it happened sometime 2,000 years BC. But we will get onto that in just a moment. And I know that the record which I make is true. Uh, that's convenient. And I make it with mine own hand, and I make it according to my knowledge. I mean, point of order, you're making it also according to your father's knowledge. You just said that. For it came to pass in the commencement of the first year of the reign of Zedekiah king of Judah, my father Lehi having dwelt at Jerusalem in all his days, and in that same year there came many prophets, prophesying unto the people that they must repent, or the great city Jerusalem must be destroyed. Okay, so a bit of research is in order. Uh, Zedekiah is in fact king of Judah around 598 BCE. So let's say 600 to make the math work. This is, again, a thousand and a half years after the exodus from Egypt. So why are they still speaking Egyptian? They are speaking Hebrew. We know they're speaking Hebrew. We have documents from the era where they're speaking Hebrew. And Hebrew is a Semitic language. Um, it is in the family of Semitic languages. And Egyptian is uh, its own set of languages. It, it, Egyptians at the time are speaking Demotic or Hieratic. And while it is possible for, for countries or nations or empires to have multiple languages, uh, uh, Greek being the lingua franca of the Roman Empire, for example, this doesn't make any sense. These are two completely separate languages, and one of them was a conquering language. It's not the language of the priests. It's not the language of the people. It's not a legal language. Uh, it's the language of a conquering country that they've been separate from for a millennia. This doesn't make sense. Um, it doesn't make sense. Moving on. Wherefore it came to pass, uh, shaking it up a little there, that my father Lehi, as he went forth, prayed unto the Lord, yea, even with all his heart, in behalf of his people, not on behalf, in behalf. And it came to pass, as he prayed unto the Lord, there came a pillar of fire, and dwelt upon a rock before him. And he saw and heard much. And because of the things which he saw and heard, he did quake and tremble exceedingly. I do like the fire on the rock thing, though. That's, that's different. It dwelt on a rock. And it also came to pass, I added the also, that he returned to his own house at Jerusalem, and he cast himself upon his bed, being overcome with the Spirit, and the things which he had seen, which he has yet to describe to us, but that's okay. And being thus overcome with the Spirit, he was carried away in a vision, even that he saw the heavens opened, and he thought he saw God sitting upon his throne. Just thought he saw God. Surrounded with numberless concourses of angels in the attitude of singing and praising their God. And it came to pass that he saw one, and that's a capital O, one, descending out of the midst of heaven, and he beheld that his luster was above that of the sun at noonday. And he also saw twelve others following him, and their brightness did exceed that of the stars in the firmament. Now at this point you might be thinking the twelve are the twelve tribes of Israel, since that's where we're supposed to be. But no, I believe, spoiler alert, that these are the twelve apostles, and that the capital O-1 is referring to Jesus. 
And they came down and went forth upon the face of the earth, and the first came and stood before my father, and gave unto him a book, and bade him that he should read. And I just want to mention that he has given him a book in a vision, in a dream. So he's reading a book in his dream, instead of just envisioning it in his dream. So just, just thought about that being odd. And it came to pass that as he read, he was filled with the Spirit of the Lord. And he read, saying, Woe, woe unto Jerusalem, for I have seen thine abominations. Yea, and many things did my father read concerning Jerusalem, that it should be destroyed, and the inhabitants thereof. Many should perish by the sword, and many should be carried away, captive into Babylon. And it came to pass that when my father had read and seen many great and marvelous things, is he going to describe these great and marvelous things? He did exclaim many things unto the Lord, such as, Great and marvelous are thy works, O Lord God Almighty! Exclamation mark. Thy throne is high in the heavens, figuratively speaking, and thy power and goodness and mercy are over all the inhabitants of the earth, except for Jerusalem, because they're terrible. And because thou art merciful, thou wilt not suffer those who come unto thee that they shall perish. And after this manner was the language of my father in the praising of his God. For his soul did rejoice, and his whole heart was filled, because of the things which he had seen, yea, which the Lord had shown unto him. Yay. I'm just, yay. Ah, so much rejoicing about people being murdered. Okay. And now I, Nephi, do not, do not make a full account. Why are you not making a full account? Do not make a full account of the things which my father hath written, for he hath written many things which he saw in visions and dreams. Well, we, we'd like to know. And he also hath written many things which he prophesied and spake unto his children, of which I shall not make a full account. Mm, okay. Well, it seems like you'd want to make a full account of prophecies and visions of God, but okay. It's your, your book, man. But I shall make an account of my proceedings in my days. Behold, I make an abridgment of the record of my father upon plates which I have made with mine own hands. Wherefore, after I have abridged the record of my father, then will I make an account of mine own life. Okay, so I, I have a small problem here, and that is flow of information being alleged. There are complaints about the Old Testament being a bit of a game of telephone or the New Testament in that we don't know how much the oral tradition changed before it was all written down. But here we have actually described to us in the text the claims that God sent the information to Lehi through a book in a vision, in a dream, and that he then passed this information along by writing or by telling Nephi. And I don't know how old Nephi is. Uh, this story makes it sound like he's not particularly old because I think there's quite a bit uh, ahead of him in this story. And Nephi then writes all this down on golden plates or something. These golden plates are then dug up by Joseph Smith, who, using a rock and a hat, if you're not aware, um, produces the Book of Mormon. This is really difficult to swallow. Is that fair? Difficult to swallow? Or bananas. That's what I meant. Bananas. This is bananas. I, I don't buy this at all. At all. I'm... I'm soldiering on, but this is really just the worst way to convince me that this is honestly what I'm supposed to believe. I'm soldiering on. Therefore, I would that ye should know that after the Lord had shown so many marvelous things unto my father Lehi, yea, concerning the destruction of Jerusalem, yea, behold, he went forth among the people who went forth. I guess Lehi, because even though we're talking about the Lord, the Lord is the subject of that sentence, Joseph Smith or Nephi. Anyway, behold, he, he went forth, Lehi, I assume, went forth among the people and began to prophesy, began to prophesy, I don't think that's how that works, and to declare unto them concerning the things which he had both seen and heard, and I guess read in a book, in a vision, in a dream. Good. And it came to pass that the Jews did mock him because of the things which he testified to them, for he truly testified of their wickedness and their abominations wickedness and abominations upon you. And he testified that the things which he saw and heard, and also the things which he had read in the book, which he saw, I, whatever, manifested plainly of the coming of the Messiah. Ooh, wow, we're, really? Are we jumping into the Messiah here? 
and also the redemption of the world. I guess so. And when the Jews heard these things, they were angry with him. Yea, even as with the prophets of old, whom they had cast out and stoned and slain. Wait, you you just said back in one four. You just said back in one four that there came many prophets in that same year prophesying unto the people that they must repent. You, why are Lehi's not telling them anything new? This is not new. And they also sought his life. Lehi's life, I assume, because you are terrible at sentence structure, that they might take it away, they being the Jews in the sentence, I assume. But behold, I, Nephi, will show unto you that the tender mercies of the Lord are over all those whom he hath chosen because of their faith, to make them mighty, even unto the power of deliverance. Wow. So, okay, that was, <laughs> that was the first chapter of 1 Nephi. Is it one Nephi, first Nephi? It is the first chapter of first Nephi. Chapter one of first Nephi. I'll, I'll work this out. And I do not remember, do not remember reading this before and it being this bizarre and this difficult and this challenging. And maybe I skimmed through it when I read it uh, the first time. But that was, uh, what's the word? Amazing. Best book ever written. No, awful. It was awful. It was tedious and boring and repetitive and I, I really, I'm glad to be through it, and I'm not looking forward to the other however many. I know there's at least a second Nephi, and there might be a third Nephi. Uh, memory failed me. But here we are, where we've made it this far. And so my first problem is the language here. It is, I think, a well-known issue with the Book of Mormon is the constant repetitive nature of some of the phrases it uses and the words it uses. The first thing I want to talk about is I want to give every possible benefit of the doubt here. I want to be as generous as possible, and try to maintain suspension of disbelief. So here is my theory, cobbled from other people's theories, but my theory about how this could have worked, and I don't believe this is just a theory, but I'm trying here. Let's say that you were carving a golden plate, and you had a, a character, a single character that meant something else happened. It's like a bullet point. And it's possible that as Joseph Smith is, is reading these characters or seeing these characters, he understands the meaning of this character, and he comes up with, or uh, the phrase he, he applies to it is, it came to pass. Now, I know that the Old Testament does this. There are uh, words in Hebrew that m indicate a passage of time, a, a moving forward of the story, and I believe that the translators uh, tended to switch things up when they translated. They, they broke out of thesaurus and um, came up with some uh, better phrasing some, to make it flow better. And maybe Joseph Smith just doesn't have in his mind that kind of thesaurus. He's just not that kind of creative type. So he just, he can't come up with anything better. Or he really loves the phrase, it came to pass. So with it came to pass, and exceedingly, and yay. That may just be how he pictures these words. I don't know. Um, I believe he's reading off of an actual bulleted list, by the way, that he's prepared beforehand, and he's just not particularly creative narrating out and fleshing out the story that he's cobbled together, the, the, the bullet points, the plot points, the outline view of um, what's supposed to happen. So, uh, I'm going to try to be forgiving in this, um, but it really makes it difficult to read. All of the subclauses, his his inability to match pronouns, to, to stick with one subject of the sentence, is, is also in, intensely frustrating. But um, So that's problem number one of many in the first book. Or, uh, this is, oof, this was a tough read. So my next issue is one that I've already covered, but I just wanted to go back and touch on, is the very convoluted path which the Book of Mormon explicitly says is how we got the book. Lehi does not go into any detail of his um, dreams and visions. He doesn't tell us anything except for what ultimately is going to happen. Jerusalem is going to be destroyed, etc. But it, it says that we are getting a second-hand account of this, you know, through Nephi, and that he, uh, Nephi, has abridged it and edited it, and I guess is going from memory this really does not improve my confidence, and the official story does not improve my confidence under what is supposed to have happened. And, and I've already went, I've already got through this. So, uh, my next issue is that Lehi and Nephi are Israelites that are living in Jerusalem 
in 600 BCE, they're Israelites, that makes them Jews. And yet when they talk about the people around them, they are abominable and wicked and so forth, it's, it's really, it starts to smack of racism, and it's impossible to believe that this story is coming from people who are themselves Jews if they're calling the Jews these things. And normally they would they would call them names, but they wouldn't say specifically you know, they were the Jews. They would be the doubters, or they would be the people who didn't understand or didn't have vision or who refused to, to listen to God. Um, and again, it, I'm struggling to maintain the suspension of disbelief that, that this is a story written by Jews about Jews. It's a story about Jews written by someone who is not Jewish. But I'm trying to pretend, and I'm struggling to. So my last problem is that the 20th uh, verse in the first chapter, the book manifested plainly of the coming of the Messiah, so they're talking about Jesus. And he's complaining that the Jews of the day are not believing that Jerusalem is going to be destroyed and that this Messiah is coming. So the destruction of Jerusalem is imminent. It's like 15 years away at most. This is a, a clear warning. But he's also talking to them about this Messiah character who they would have no idea what he's talking about. It's not going to happen for 600 years. 600 years. Why would they care? Why are they worried about this? Your city's going to be destroyed. Oh, wow. How, how do you know that? Oh, my gosh. We need to talk about that. 600 years from now, all of this, you know, theologically amazing stuff is happening. But, well, I'm not going to be there, and I don't care. <laughs> I don't see why... I don't see why this is a thing. I don't see why uh, Lehi is bringing this up and, and telling the people of Jerusalem. There's no reason for this, and, and historically there's no mention of this. The, the Jews don't become messianic until much, much later, and it reaches sort of fever pit when they fall to Rome. None of this is going to mean anything to them. None of this is important, and it's it's clearly a major, major aspect of this, and I assume it's going to be a major aspect moving forward, so... Yeah, so I got to make a little uh, Jesus character to walk around, <laughs> which was not something I was expecting to do this soon. So, And that, that really concludes the first chapter of the first book of Nephi. So um, I hope you come back, and uh, I hope you live through my getting to understand the intricacies of the microphone and switching microphones and trying to get these goofy little animations to work right. And... Uh, you know, I, I have a bunch of work put into at least one Nephi, and uh, we'll see where it goes. But I hope you enjoyed, and uh, like and subscribe if you enjoyed it, and uh, see you next time.